Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Open Source in Business, a speaker series where we explore uh, various aspects of open source in business and the role that open source has in uh, in uh, in companies in general and in the computer industry as a whole. Uh, today, I'm joined by Heather Rocker, uh, who is the executive director of the Drupal Association, and Dries Boitart. Uh, I'm you're going to have to correct my pronunciation of your surname, Dries. Um, who is the founder uh, of uh, the Drupal project and the uh, CTO, I believe, of Acquia, um, a company that, that was established around Drupal uh, a number of years after its creation. And today we're going to explore uh, some of the, the, the history of Drupal. Drupal is a 20-year-old project uh, that started in a, in a college dorm room and, uh, and succeeded in creating this huge econ um, commercial ecosystem around the project and even managed to navigate the transition from a, a founder who was not commercially interested in the commercially interested in the sense of having a financial stake in the success of the project to um, founding a, a company around the project and, and succeeded in doing that without damaging the ecosystem. Um, so I'm really interested to dig into, you know, First, I guess the early days of Drupal. I've seen those pictures from the first Drupal cons, Reese, <laughs> where you started off with like twelve people and yeah. quickly grew to uh, by the fifty. Uh, twelve is maybe an exaggeration, but by the fifth year, you had this photo of twelve hundred people on the steps of a building or something like that. It's, how was how how were those early days of growth like from the origin? Why did you start building Drupal in the first place? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. And by the way, nobody even tries to pronounce my last name. So uh, <laughs> most people just call me Dries. But if you want to know, it's pronounced uh, Bertart. But um, either way, um, yeah. So as you mentioned, I started the Drupal project um, like over 20 years ago now. And at the time, I was a student at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And uh, I really kind of started Drupal by accident, if you will, in the sense that I wanted to build a message board for me and some other friends in my dorm room. It was never meant to be a public site. It was kind of an internal message board. And I uh, also wanted to learn about PHP and MySQL at the time, which, again, 21 years ago or so was the kind of new technology. It was like all the, you know, all the rage. And uh, I just wanted to dabble with those new technologies too. And so, wanted to scratch my own itch, uh, as we say in open source, right? And uh, that's really how, how Drupal got started. So um, eventually that message board turned into more of an experimental platform. I moved out of my dorm room, uh, decided to make that internal message board public. So moved it to the public internet. Uh, and then, you know, at some point decided to Make it open source, you know the 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 code behind my own website, effectively. So, so it wasn't open source from the start. How long from starting to work on it to actually open sourcing it, and how how conscious was that decision, uh, in the sense of like, did you have any inkling of what was going to come afterwards? No. Uh, uh, so it's actually yeah. So when I when I finished school, I I moved out of the dorm with this fun little community going. And uh, I didn't want to kill that when I moved out. And so I'm like, you know what? I'll move it to the public internet and uh, we could stay in touch on, on this website. And so that website, um, you know, became a public website and it evolved into an experimental website where I dabbled with sort of emerging web technologies. For example, I added RSS feeds at the time that RSS was kind of being invented or I added a feature called uh, public diaries, which eventually became blogging. And so again, this was before blogging was a, actually a, a term. <laughs> um, and so that website started to attract a lot of people interested in the future of the web. And uh, they started giving suggestions like, oh, maybe you should implement this. Maybe you should change that. And uh, at some point I was like, you know what? Maybe I should open source my website or the code behind my website so it can be your own experimental platform and uh, literally copied the gpl license file from my linux kernel uh, into my website i spent 30 seconds thinking about the name drupal uh, created a tarball or a zip file if you want but it was a tarball and uh, uploaded it to my blog and uh, expected maybe 10 people to use it 
right? So I feel very much like I created this project sort of by accident, <laughs> not expecting that much people to use it. Um, and it started to slowly take off, you know, like one user at a time, kind of uh, for 20 years <laughs> now. <laughs> but um, yeah, it wasn't there wasn't a master plan or a grand plan, I should say, around uh, making Drupal a open source success or a commercial success or anything like it. So when did you when did you come become aware of the first uh, commercial studio or you know people using Drupal to make money by building websites for other people? I think the first Drupal shops or agencies or companies were created around 2004, I would say. So that's when Drupal was released in 2001. So it took about three years actually before I would say the first commercial companies were started specifically around Drupal. And those were typically um, you know, web development shops people that would take Drupal and then build websites <laughs> with it. Um, and, you know, we got a lot of traction because in, um, you know, 2004 uh, was a presidential elections at the time. And Howard Dean was one of the presidential candidates, obviously didn't win. Um, but he was the first presidential candidate to really leverage the internet to campaign. And he created a platform that's called Dean Space to do grassroots, political yep. campaigning and it was all I, built I remember, on Drupal. I mean mm -hmm. I wasn't here at the time, but uh, I do remember, you know, the, the presidential campaign that was done in by the the howl, I think was the was the thing that <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. That yeah. was, and, and it was part really of it. A, like the fifty state strategy and the that was a predecessor to, you know, the, the Obama campaign that came four years later in some sense. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because that was such a great success, even though Howard Dean didn't work, that people said, well, the next presidential election, everybody's going to use a, a campaign platform. And and in fact, the next election, every presidential candidate used Drupal uh, to campaign online. Um, and so, but anyway, Howard Dean using Drupal sort of in 2003, that time frame during the campaign period, um, gave us a lot of credibility and actually led to the first sort of um, professional investor making an investment in Drupal too. Like there was a company called Civic Space, and uh, yeah, some Donald invest Global, right? That the, is that is that. Donald I think Global he was involved. I'm not sure, um, okay. but it was basically the team behind Dean Space, and they literally kind of cobbled something together <laughs> in the midst of the campaign, you know, uh, experimenting, and they said, "Wow, uh, this really has some legs," and. Um, we should really invest in making it a better platform. So by next time around, it will, um, you know, be used widely, and there's maybe a commercial model around it. And mm -hmm. funny enough, they raised like three hundred thousand dollars. So maybe not a lot in the world of uh, venture funding. But um, and the funny thing is, like, like a year into it, they're like, so what do we do in the meantime? <laughs> and they, because you know, it's every four years, as you know, and so they decided to. Uh, help campaign for Firefox, as you may remember. And so in many ways, this platform, you know, Drupal backed platform helped put Firefox on the map. They created a site called Spread Firefox, which you may remember, which did some amazing things like raising $50,000 to take out a two page ad in the New York Times to go after, you know, Microsoft Internet Explorer as an example. Yep. So anyway, that was a lot of these kind of early stories and successes that really kind of kick-started, I guess, the commercial ecosystem around Drupal. It's, a, it's an interesting cross-reference to, uh, well, I had John Lilly from the Mozilla Corporation oh, yeah. on last season. Mm -hmm. And he we, we mentioned the two-page uh, Mozilla, the Firefox, the Firefox ad. And uh, yeah, it, there, there was heady days. I didn't, I wasn't aware that uh, Drupal was involved in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, indirectly, right? Like we were the platform mm -hmm. that Mozilla used to promote Firefox, and um, they that, they experimented. I mean, I guess it goes back to these roots of Drupal being an experimental platform. It allowed them to do all sorts of interesting, innovative campaign techniques and mm -hmm. you know social media techniques, which at the time were still like very new and, yep. and in a way unheard of, right? Like we take for granted today that <laughs> there's Twitter, Facebook, mobile, at all of these things, but at the time. Uh, all of these things were early, early days. And so. at the time, the Drupal project was entirely unstructured, right? There wasn't a corporate 
or um, uh, there wasn't a, any organizational structure around it. Um, That's right. At what point did the, the Drupal Association, um, at what point was that kind of conceived and created? Uh, maybe Heather, do you want to do you want to take us through the early days of the association? I can, but Dries might be better to do that since it started started in Belgium uh, with a very different purpose than it is today. So Dries, if you want to if you yeah, want to speak to the early sure. days, one fun note about the Howard Dean story is Neil Drum, who worked on the Dean campaign uh, and worked within the Drupal platform. There actually works with us at the Drupal Association still today. So we still have some of those roots embedded with our team that works for Drupal. Yeah, um, it's funny. I think the Drupal Association was founded in 2009, I believe. So quite a few years after Drupal was started. But you know, you you, you referenced the Drupal conferences, uh, Dave. I think it was 2009. I might be wrong. Um, but um, we started putting on these conferences, and we had no structure or organizational structure to really help with that. And so often I would uh, put all of these expenses <laughs> on my credit on my uh, checking account, let's say, or my personal checking account. We would raise money from sponsors, we would pay bills, and you know, it's not a good thing to do, quite honestly, because uh, you know, technically, when money comes in from organizations, that's considered personal income. You have to pay personal income taxes on these things. So, you know, as these events started to become like you know, a little bit larger, it was very clear that we needed to have um, really a corporate bank accounts was really, and a checking account was really the core needs that kicked it all off. Like it wasn't, again, anything bigger necessarily. It was just like, how do we do basic finance as well, <laughs> according to the law? Um, and that's what triggered it. And then over time, it evolved to have a much bigger mission, um, you know, for the Drupal project. Trigger? Said it again? Oh, triggered it. Trigger, uh, yes. Uh, like, yeah, you know, I heard that's what Trigger did, and I was wondering what Trigger was. Um, but wasn't there a DrupalCon incorporated before there was a Drupal Association? Yes. That's, yeah, that's yeah. technically the legal name. So it was. It's. It's the IRS 501c3 documentation was filed as DrupalCon Inc. Because, as Dries mentioned at that point, it really was. You know, we need a legal entity to for the funds to go through so we can host these conferences that are getting larger and larger, yep. and we know we're going to do more and more of them. So we're technically DrupalCon Inc. doing business as the Drupal Association because we've very much grown from the entity that just focuses on a conference. And it's one thing we do, and it's a big thing we do, but it's definitely not everything we do. So it really, you know, when I kind of look at the, at the work that we own <laughs> and have responsibility for around, around the project, you know, if you go to d.org, we're we're managing the infrastructure, we're managing the the hosting of it. We we build the tools so that people can build Drupal, um, and it's even gone beyond that. So we're really serving with our, you know, when you talked earlier about the the corporate, the business community side of this, right? And so that's a big piece of our advocacy is advocating for Drupal, being able to do that advocacy with end users and potential Drupal users connecting them to the business community, making sure the business community that thrives on Drupal has the support that they need. Um, and then in addition to that, there's still the individual contributor components. So how do we enable contribution, make it easier for people to get connected? What are the tools they need? Where are those gaps? How do we kind of bridge any of the gaps in the project so that everybody can be more successful? But the, the breadth of what we are responsible for now as an association is really large. Um, and one of the things we've taken on in 2021 as part of our new strategic plan is all of those things, plus looking at the talent pipeline. So one of the questions that comes up a lot, both from the business community that thrives off Drupal and our end users, right? Our, our enterprise end users is, okay, one of the things I look at is the talent pool. And so if I'm going to adopt Drupal or whatever, whatever the platform is, where am I going to find the talent? Is it does it exist? Is you know is it a tiny pool of people or is it large? And where is the next you know where is the next wave of Drupalers coming from? So we're really focused on how we can help from the talent perspective as well. So did you need just as a, a point of curiosity? Did you need a bylaws change from uh, having an organization focused on the conference to broader advocacy and and uh, business enablement, business development? I can talk to that if you want, Heather. Sure. Um, actually, 
I also have to correct, I said we started in 2009, but we actually incorporated uh, a Belgian nonprofit organization in 2006. And a um, couple years in, we felt like we needed a second organization um, to, to do business in the US or make that easier. And that's where DrupalCon, um, that nonprofit got started. And later we ended up shutting down the Belgian one <laughs> um, because, um, you know, for, for all sorts of tactical reasons, really. But um, when we wrote the bylaws, they're actually online still, the original bylaws. You uh, can find them on my site. Um, they have evolved, but when we started, we actually did think about a broader scope. While the core need was a, a bank account, um, we did have a vision for the Drupal Association taking on a, a broader role in time. I'm sure we've okay. evolved and tweaked the bylaws because we've changed our governance model, how we elect members, et cetera, et cetera. But from day one though, we were thinking bigger than just a checking account, even though we just that needed a checking account. primary driving requirement. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that, that was I just uh, looking Drupal uh, VZW. Is that's that right, that's, the that's uh, Belgian yeah. non-profit. Yeah, yeah VZW. So something, what, what? Say, say that again? What do, what does what does the VZW stand oh, for? Oh, it, it means in Dutch uh, "vereniging zonder uh, winstoogmerk." That's Dutch for nonprofit organization, effectively. Okay. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> again an interesting connection is that the Eclipse Foundation just recently became a Belgian. Oh, really? Yeah, or is in the process of becoming. Uh, so they're establishing their own VZW. Right. Um, I did not know. There you go. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> one of the one of the most complicated. Uh, transitions is when uh, a volunteer leader becomes somebody who's financially interested in the project. It's it's one that catches up a lot of pro a, a lot of particularly projects that are sourced from a single company, where a company releases a project as an open source project, and then um, maybe a year or two years later has to pivot in some sense because they need to find a more viable business model, for example. Um, and that's a kind of a transition that in uh, I know it was a little bit painful, and maybe you can talk to the, the some of the growing pains after uh, you were involved in founding Acquia. Um, Dries? Dries? Yeah. Dries, yeah. Dries? I can, yeah. Um, yeah, so I started Acquia um, 2007, 2008. So again, after Drupal had already had some commercial momentum, there was an ecosystem. Uh, but at the time, um, that ecosystem was you know, small, small organizations, you know, like two, three people, maybe the largest Drupal company, I don't know, is 12 people or something. So today there's companies with a few hundred people doing Drupal services work, just to put that in perspective. Uh, and we also started to see adoption of larger organizations. And it really felt like for Drupal to be successful, it needed a company like, let's say, Red Hat, uh, for Linux. And so the original vision for Acquia was to be to Drupal what Red Hat was for Linux and to help um, larger companies be successful for Drupal. And I ended up raising $7 million uh, to start the company, to get it off the ground. And when we announced that, it created a shockwave, really, through our community because uh, for the first sort of seven years or six, seven years of the project, as a project lead, I was... Um, I had no commercial interest. I was kind of Switzerland or completely neutral. And, um, you know, some people were skeptical that I could still act in the best interest of the project, um, you know, with 7 million in commercial funding. Um, and, you know, I made a commitment to the, to the community that I would act in the best interest of the project. And uh, I think, you know, in the last, you know, 14 years, that's exactly what I've done over and over again. And I think people have gotten very comfortable uh, with that today, but I went to great lengths to achieve that. Um, one unknown fact, I don't know if I've ever talked about this, is um, when I was uh, raising money and closed that first round of funding, I really made sure that the investors understood open source. And I actually had them sign a document, which might be hard to believe, but I wrote a document that says along the lines, I, Dries, project lead of Drupal, can do whatever I want with the Drupal project, <laughs> even if it commercially harms Acquia. Like it was something along those lines and they signed it. 
you know for me that was like a milestone very important document and they said yeah no um, we understand that the success of Acquia is tied to the success of Drupal if Drupal is successful Acquia will be successful and vice versa if Acquia is successful you know Drupal will also uh, be more successful because of it and that's kind of the philosophy that we had from day one from the founding of the company and it's embedded in our DNA to give back uh, like literally we have what we call our corporate DNA it's like six items and give back more is literally the sentence give back more that we have in our DNA and it's all about contributing back to our communities that we're part of and Drupal being uh, probably the biggest one but also our local communities like the tech community and the places where we have offices etc cetera, etc cetera. but um, you know we're really founded as an open source company and we take great pride in being an open source based company and giving back is you know core to what we do today and uh, even today um, you know I think we have like maybe 30 or so full-time contributors uh, to Drupal maybe 25 to 30, that, that order. Um, and now all, all they do is contribute back to the open source Drupal. So, but we still have a very healthy ecosystem in the sense that, you know, Acqui is the largest contributor, um, but I think only, you know, less than 5% of all of the contributions come from Acquia. So we have extreme uh, diversity of contributors like every year, just to put that in perspective, like because Drupal is one of the largest open source projects even uh, today, and we continue to grow year over year. Um, but we have, um, like we measured this actually, but last year, I think we had around 9,000 or something individual contributors that we could measure and over 1,200 um, commercial contributors. You know, organizations that contribute so thousands of people and you know over a thousand organizations contribute and Acquia being one of many right and so we we managed to have a healthy i think balance there and because, as, as a <clears throat> cto of a company uh do you kind of divide do you do you have a do you consider that part of the platform is a core platform that you feel like um, is more important to have more contribution or more maintenance of as Acquia? You know, do, do you divide it into core and non-core platform components in your head? Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I understand the question, actually. Yeah. So maybe I don't. <laughs> well, I'll try and rephrase. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is there, like, you have a large contributor base. Would you say that there's a core to the Drupal platform where... Yes. Um, Acquia continues to be the primary contributor. Yes, we are. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, now I understand. Yeah, so the way Drupal is organized is we have what we call Drupal Core, literally Drupal Core. And then we have like 40,000 something plugins, modules, we call them, or extensions, if you want. Mm -hmm. And I think the work that Acquia tends to focus on is the really hard work that's maybe harder to do as a volunteer contributor. You know, there's a certain kind of technical projects or initiatives that just require a team of people to go at it for months at a time you know like like sort of in the guts of drupal like <laughs> and so a lot of the projects that we do are those ones because um they're just really hard to accomplish through you know volunteer contribution and what i mean by that is it's hard to kind of do some of these things if you can only contribute you know three four hours a week you're kind of at it on your own Right, so we 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 we, uh, we choose very carefully what we contribute um, on as Acquia. So another key decision, I think, in the early days of the association was the management of the Drupal trademark. Uh, you presumably owned the trademark before the establishment of the foundation, and I still do actually. Yeah. Oh, do you? Yeah, but I gave the so I created a trademark policy that provides the governance for the trademark. Um, I own, technically I own the domain names too, but I've given the management of it to the Drupal Association. So, okay. like so for Heather, do you wanna... practical purposes, the DA manages all of that. Uh, Heather, can you talk a little bit about the importance of the Drupal trademark and how you manage that and how you, like, do you have a, is there a, a different type of relationship that you have with different members depending on 
you know how they use or how they want to use the Drupal trademark. What's uh, what are the what, what, how does that policy apply to you know the the business ecosystem around Drupal? So I th you know I I think we tend to be fairly generous, and this is in in collaboration with Drees, where anytime we're making a decision about the usage of it, we always collaborate and say, hey, you know, does this make sense or does this violate something? Um, you know, we tend to be really generous, and, and this goes back to kind of Drees' philosophy around, you know, obviously we're going to let, if you want to host a Drupal camp, right, some kind of Drupal event where you're engaging your local or regional community, that's usually an, an easy yes please do use that. If, if, you know, any kind of formation of people getting together to work on Drupal or to advocate for Drupal, it's easy um, to make that decision. I think where it gets a little bit harder is where businesses may want to use it within their legal business name. And we have to be careful about that, right? So Acqui is not called <laughs> Drupal, <laughs> right? Or Acquia slash Drupal, right? There, there are reasons you don't want businesses specifically attached to Drupal from a from a business ecosystem perspective, right? Who gets to use that? How do you not end up with everybody having it in their legal name, right? So that's where we tend to, and Dries, you can correct me mm -hmm. on your thoughts on this too, but we tend to guard the trademark from a legal business perspective, but be very generous with it from a community perspective. And then what's in between there, of course, is us constantly looking at the general brand management of Drupal because things are not all done by the Drupal Association, right? So you've got businesses that are doing marketing and outreach, you've got individuals, you've got, you know, kind of this volunteer slash business slash nonprofit component where we all have to work together from a brand management perspective. But from the purely legal side, you know, for community, it's almost always a yes. Uh, and then from a business side, we just have to be more careful with it. Yeah, Heather summarized it really well. Would, uh, one thing maybe, which is we basically condensed the trademark summary to an algorithm. You know, like it actually doesn't take that much management right now because the policy outlines how you can use the name Drupal, when you can use it, when you cannot use it. And, you know, I think for the most part, people follow the rules mm -hmm. and it's kind of self-governing now. Like we actually don't have to spend that much time. There's the occasional, um, you know, violation that we need to then, you know, email them, et cetera. But for the most part, people understand and it kind of creates an even playing field you know like we get equal rights to the name drupal and that's the spirit of the um, uh of the trademark policy and i and yeah every company's equal in that regard like and to heather's point aquia follows the same rules uh, as any other company so you mentioned that uh, company names including drupal is a no-go uh how about product names like is there a, is there a way that i can say you know the Red Hat distribution of Drupal. Um, like, how would I, how do you govern companies who are including yeah. the Drupal brand as part of a product name? So that is allowed um, under certain. There better some rules around it. So, but you have to absolutely avoid <laughs> um, the perception that maybe your product name is uh, is officially affiliated with Drupal. So that means the way that is embedded in our rules is like your own company name needs to be in the product name too. Um, so let's say um, you have a product, I don't know. <laughs> it always has to say your name and then something, something Drupal or something, okay. you know? Like you can, for example, you can say mm -hmm. Drupal certified. If let's say you have a certification product, you have to say Drupal certified by Acquia or Acquia Drupal certified. You have to very clearly specify um, that it's not the official Drupal certification. I just gave an example, but that applies to all kinds of products. And the same thing with, you can call your company Drupal Consulting, you know, or Drupal Services or Drupal, you know, like, because that would be confusing. People might think that's the official Drupal Services company. So you have to name your company something else, but then yes, we want you to advertise. You have Drupal Services. So you need to be able to say, uh, you know, the Dave Drupal Consulting <laughs> Company or something, <laughs> and that's fine. You did touch on something which was going to be my next question, which is, you know, how how rigorously do you monitor the what Drupal people are distributing? Um, so, like you you mentioned certification, if somebody is shipping a Drupal based product, 
Mm -hmm. um, do you have some kind of API uh, compliance test that verifies that Drupal extensions from Drupal.org will run on it? Or you know, is, there, is, there, is that kind of the Wild West? Uh, Heather, do you want to talk a, bit, a little bit about that kind of practical element of? Yeah, and I, I think it's a little bit case by case. I, one of the things to know is that our entire Drupal Association team is all of 14 people doing all those things. So I think, you know, if we were much, much larger, we may have a team that would just focus on trademark infringement and, and product installations and be able to do all those things. So it's it's really not something we spend a lot of time on, as Dries mentioned. You know, if we find if somebody points it out or we or we find it, um, you know, we definitely address it. As far as the product piece, Dries, you may be able to, to speak to that too. It's it's not something we deal with very often. Um, so I don't know if it's something that that Dries you've run across before. Yeah, like Dave, what would be an example uh, in your mind? Like somebody abusing the name Drupal? Well, I know or... that, um, again, going back to the Firefox example, mm -hmm. uh, that Firefox uh, required that all official Firefox plugins work on any distribution of Firefox if you wanted to use the I Firefox see. brand. Mm -hmm. So that was part of their trademark policy. That was one mm -hmm. of the reasons why they had a dispute with the Debian project at one point, as you I may see. remember. Uh, because um, because some of the plugins were not working on Debian because they had too many patches that were basically breaking the API yeah. and API comp compatibility there. Yeah, we don't have any anything like that actually. So okay, it's kind of grassroots. If <laughs> I mean, we provide end users tools to see the quality of a module and could and we show like you know, mem number of open bugs, um, number of installations, um, like that kind of metrics we share okay. with people that want to install a module. And then we kind of have them assess it that way, I guess. But we don't officially bless right. modules. Um, okay. So your mileage may vary. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Some modules are really well maintained, have kind of teams behind them. Another, another module may be abandoned because the maintainer you know, life happened, <laughs> let's say. And then we try to mark that on on the project page is what we call it, on the download mm -hmm. page, if you will. And so as an end user, you can make your own judgment. Like, am I willing to take a little bit more risk or am I willing to use an abandoned module, maybe take over maintenance even, mm -hmm. or I'm going to stick to these modules that are sort of battle tested and well-maintained. And okay. depending on who you are, I'd say, as an organization, you may be comfortable with the former or you may be extremely uncomfortable with it and you can make your own kind of um, educated decision that's how we do it and has worked well um, you know having certifications for modules is i think a good idea too like it really helps the end user but we, we don't have that in place today so um heather can you talk a little bit about some of the uh, activities that the association does to to promote companies who are delivering Drupal services uh, or selling Drupal-based products, you know wh wh what role does the Drupal Association play in in maintaining a healthy commercial ecosystem, and and how do you kind of measure the health of the ecosystem? So I think the measurement piece is hard. So I'll hold on on that one. Um, and if anybody has figured out how to do that really really well from a community project standpoint, let us know because it's always a little bit challenging. I think that we. I, I will say from a measurement standpoint, a, a lot of what we do isn't necessarily, you know, here's the formula and now we know exactly where we sit, but we have a lot of conversations, right? And, and we make sure that we're connected. And so when we're hearing from businesses, an example would be when the pandemic hit, we were very concerned in understanding what is the health of our business community, because we know that's going to have a far reaching effect. So having those conversations around what, what are you feeling? What are you seeing? How's this impacting you? Because we know that extrapolates and we want to be ready to support that. I can tell you the conversations I'm hearing now, um, and, and Dries actually wrote an article about this, how, how sometimes economic downturns are actually good for open source and in particular <laughs> Drupal. And so the conversations we're having now from a, from a business community health standpoint is, uh, we're so busy from this pivot, this industry-wide pivot to digital transformation as part of the way that our world changed, that we we have more work than we can do. And we're actually, we're more concerned about hiring people than we are about finding work. So I think from that perspective, things are going well, but you know, a lot of that's anecdotal. We try to look at, you know, 
there are some measurements you can run on how many sites, but sometimes that's misleading because of the depth and breadth of a site versus just in the number of sites. And Drupal sites tend to be more um, ambitious and, and, and larger in scope in what they're trying to do. So that number doesn't necessarily work either. So it's a little bit of mix of you know, what numbers we can pull and what conversations we can have. Where we try to really support the Drupal business community is, you know, a lot of what we do is serve as a convener. And how do we convene everything that exists? Like, so all these Drupal resources exist. How do we convene them to have the most positive impact on the project? And then how do we amplify and advocate the people that are actually contributing to Drupal? So that contribution piece is really important to us always, but especially right now, we're looking very strategically at how do we get more people into contribution? And, and the, rate, the reason I mentioned that in relation to the business community is there's a very strong link between businesses that contribute to an open source project and businesses that are successful. And so doing those contributions is really important. There's actually an, um, an article McKinsey just put out in February about veloc uh, uh, the velocity of developers, right? So this developer velocity index, this VDI, and, and one of the things they measured was companies that were not only involved in open source and had open source as part of their tech stack, but the ones that actively contributed to open source had a higher velocity developer index than those that didn't. And so there's a couple reasons for that. One is we know businesses that contribute by doing that, you're learning more about Drupal. You're becoming a Drupal expert by being in the project and getting, getting your hands on a keyboard or having non-code contribution, right? And helping from a marketing documentation, kind of all those things too. You're gonna know more about Drupal and you're gonna know it at a deeper level by being involved in it. And then the second piece is from a talent perspective, which I mentioned earlier, um, you know, developers that love Drupal, love contributing to Drupal and wanna work somewhere that they have that opportunity. So if you're one of these businesses that has more work than they can get done and you're now recruiting, it really behooves you to also be a major contributor, at least to the scale of which you can, because that becomes a talent play. That becomes a recruiting tool for you. So what we do to amplify and support those things is we really try to, we try to make it clear both on drupal.org and, and in, in our communications, who are those contributors to Drupal, both individuals and company-wide? How much are they contributing? Where are they contributing? So that if you're an individual looking to go somewhere, right, you, you want to work for a company, okay, are they actively contributing or not? If you're an enterprise end user evaluating Drupal, which companies do I want to work with? Because more and more enterprise users are understanding the value of getting a vendor who's a contributor versus a vendor who's not. So we want to make sure that people make those connections. One program we're working on this year in particular and we actually talked about certification a little bit earlier, um, but we're actually working on um, a certified Drupal program, which is where we, this is one way for us to both recognize and reward the organizations that contribute meaningfully to the Drupal project and be able to connect those to this enterprise or end user community. So we get a lot of people that organically come to us and say, hey, I'm doing an RFP, I'm interested in Drupal, Drupal Association, give us a quote. So there's a little misunderstanding about what we do versus how we convene the community. But the opportunity we have is to pass those leads and those opportunities to our Drupal business community. And when you think about how you do that fairly or more importantly, equitably, it makes sense for us to reward the companies that are significant contributors who are who are supporting the project in the ways that matter most. So we're looking more and more how we can do that. So how do you balance showcasing individuals? Uh, that are individually contributing and companies, employers that are that are uh, kind of allowing or supporting their their employees to to contribute. Do you do both or we do both. So if you if you look at um, a Dries note that happens twice a year at at DrupalCon North America or DrupalCon Europe, there's almost always an opportunity, whether it's Dries or or myself or someone else from the Drupal Association that recognizes here are the top individual contributors. Here are the top uh, you know, contributing organizations. Both are listed on D.org. Um, you know, we have our contribution credit system so that people actually get that contribution credit measured and we can display that for people to see. Um, so you know, I think there are a lot of ways that we, that we try to recognize and, and 
and make that public. I think there's always work we can do. I think when you have such a large community of contributors, it's always challenging. How do we do this really well and make it really easy and make people and companies feel really good about it? So, I, you know, I think it's something we're always going to keep working on. But we definitely, you know, when we think about contribution, I know at least from our team perspective, we, we want to be as thoughtful and thankful to the individuals who maybe are sponsored by their by their organizations, but maybe not, right? They just, they love Drupal and this is what they love to do and, and they deserve that recognition. Um, but it's important for organizations that are giving their, they're giving their employees time to contribute back to Drupal as part of their job. Um, you know, I think it's harder and harder for people to contribute to open source as hobbyists. That's yep. a luxury. And it's a luxury that doesn't exist um, very commonly. And quite frankly, when we start talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, that luxury is non-existent. So we, we have to really incentivize organizations in this business ecosystem to fund the contribution to Drupal, or we're not going to be able to diversify the contribution base that's going into both Drupal and other open source projects. Yeah, I think actually this is an area where Drupal is really leading in the open source world, like what we're doing around the credit system and recognizing individual contributors, commercial sponsors. Like, I think we do it, frankly, better than anyone else that I've seen. <clears throat> and we've spent a lot of time and energy building out our own tools, you know, this credit system tool, um, you know, to do that. So, like, for example, we can, when somebody contributes something to Drupal, we can say, well, this was done by Dave, but also these other three people. Here's the funding of behind each of these people. Dave gets paid by this company. And in fact, Dave's company did it on behalf of a customer that they have. So you can kind of see the whole chain of funding um, for every contribution to the project. And that allows us to really understand uh, where contributions come from and recognize even the customer you know, because we may have a customer like NBC that is actually spending maybe millions of dollars, you know, giving back to Drupal. But it would be wrong to only give the credit to the individual contributor at the other end of that. You know, we really feel like we should recognize those individual contributors, the employer of the individual contributor, as well as the end customer that is actually writing the check, you know. And, um, and do you find that end customers... Uh, are usually happy to get that exposure? Because I imagine that there's a, a, a little bit of tension between, you know, I'm paying for some work to be done. Um, I don't want to be a public reference for this company, or yeah. there are a lot of more rules around being a public reference for, for a services company than there are around, you know, having a, a contribution listed on a community website. I guess it would, it's, I would say it depends. Like some organizations are really insistent actually on having their name there because being recognized as a good open source citizen or a very active open source contributor actually allows them to hire better engineers or developers because to heather's point uh, if you are very passionate about drupal you want to go work for those employers that allow you to contribute so for some of these organizations it's actually a <clears throat> pr tool and a recruiting tool and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have organizations that are like, yeah, no, we don't want to be known as an open source contributor. That would create all sorts of legal questions. <laughs> like, we right. don't want to deal with it. We don't care. You know what I mean? And so it just I mean, really I, depends. I guess what I'm getting at is I've I've had issues, uh, like, in my own experience, getting, getting a company to say, um, you know, showcase a contributor who is an employee of a company and saying, you know, Jane, who works for, you know, the Department of Defense, um, has been working with this project, and uh, we love her work. Um, that's one thing, and getting that kind of thing on the on a on a project website is fine. Getting a D Department of Defense logo on there, as you know, this is a, the Department of Def Defense are using this project, mm -hmm. is a whole different approval chain. Um, yeah. That's a lot more complicated, and I'm just wondering if you have that. Um, if you have that tension where a, cus a customer is paying a services company to do some work and there may be a, an NDA confidentiality agreement or, you know, as part of their normal services agreement, you may not cite us as a reference customer. 
yeah, that exists, right? And I think a lot of us and Heather and the Drupal Association in particular, they're constantly promoting all the reasons why you should contribute to Drupal. But to give you an example, uh, during the Obama administration, um, you know, uh, the White House ran on Drupal. First time in the history of the US that the White House used open source. And so that was step one. And then um, many of us in the community worked with the White House to actually not only make them a user of Drupal, but also a contributor to Drupal. It took a little bit of time to, you know, evangelize why they should contribute to Drupal, but they did, you know, they became an active contributor to the Drupal project. So, you know, I think there's a, there's sort of a, a life cycle or a maturity model, if you want to use that term, around going from an occasional user of open source to being a contributor. There's a lot of steps in that journey. And especially for large organizations or government organizations, there's quite a few hoops to jump through. Um, but what we find is that with a little bit of help and an internal champion, there's usually somebody very passionate about it internally too, right? Yeah. These two things combined, um, more often than not, can lead to the organization being comfortable uh, contributing. And today we have amazing stories like, for example, with Pfizer and Johnson and & Johnson uh, and Novartis, all of these like multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical companies that are competitors, right? But they're also all contributing to Drupal. I mean, they've all gotten comfortable with contributing to Drupal despite, um, you know, being competitors. So, you know, if large companies, I mean, these, these are some of the largest companies in the world can get comfortable mm -hmm. with that. Um, my my hope is that most companies will. So. I, I really like the the focus that you have uh, both in the association and 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 you personally, Dries, on on uh, getting more people involved in contributing to projects. It's often the the biggest roadblock, the the stumbling stumbling block that you have. And you wrote a, an article about this a couple of years ago, uh, balancing makers and takers in open source projects, yeah. which I think was pretty influential in in kind of. Um, Trying to create the the incentive system for people to give back to, uh, or well, not create, but documenting the way that you've created an incentive system around Drupal. Right. Um, I'm curious, how was it in the early days? Because I imagine if you're if you're a small Drupal shop, mm -hmm. you've got two or three people, uh, you're essentially consuming Drupal as a as a way to get something to your customers quicker than doing it from scratch or doing it with something else. Um, so community contribution in that situation could be a significant overhead to your activity. And I imagine that's still the case even as as it, as the, the project has evolved, is that you know there are a lot of people who see a, a financial incentive to use but not contribute back to, to Drupal. How do you formulate that argument that actually it's in your financial interest to make sure that this is a long-term sustainable platform, to ensure that you're participating in the project, that you have influence, that you have visibility. Um, you know, first, like, how has that changed from the 2004, 2005, 2006 days, the early days, uh, where I, I guess you were like, at what point did you start to see more contributors coming into the project? And were those contributors coming in from Drupal shops, or were they volunteers? And then, you know, how has that evolved to where it is today? Yeah, I mean, in the early days, it was all volunteers, obviously. Um, and over time, um, as you know, Drupal businesses were created, uh, we've seen like almost like a multi-decade shift towards fewer and fewer hobbyists and more and more sponsored contribution. And today, just to put that in perspective, uh, two thirds of all of the contribution is sponsored, meaning comes from a customer or from one of those Drupal agencies or shops. Um, so there's been a shift where we've really embraced the commercial interests in the project and um, used that actually to drive contribution. And we've done that successfully because uh, we've never seen as much contribution ever in, in the history of our project. So um, I think it's a healthy shift, even though a lot of people in the open source community more broadly are kind of anxious, I guess, about commercial involvement, right? But we've learned with Drupal that it's actually a very healthy thing. And um, as Heather pointed out, it's it's also really important when looked at through a diversity and inclusion lens, quite honestly, because volunteer contribution is often a privilege, you know? Um, 
but um yeah so it has evolved um i mean i think today we see that both end users let's call them customers as well as the drupal uh, services companies have become increasingly smart about this right so first of all we see a lot of um end users that as part of the procurement process if you will as part of deciding which Drupal or which agency to work with to build their website, the best ones, the smartest ones, actually mandate that they contribute to open source. They've learned that to get the best possible service, the highest quality talent, um, putting in that requirement uh, to contribute, like they literally are asking, show me all of your contributions to the Drupal project. And if you can't produce any, you're automatically disqualified from winning a project. And it's amazing what that does. Um, and it's and happening more and yeah. more. And we talked about the government sector and how potential restrictions exist there. I'm actually seeing the opposite, right? So I'm seeing exactly what Dries is talking about. So I'll pick my hometown example. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and georgia.gov uh, is open source, runs on Drupal. And when I met um, with the leadership team there, it was this exact example. We will only work with vendors who have contributed back to the project. And that is in our RFP, and we're very clear about that. And they actually advocate with their, their peers in government and in technology and say, you should be doing the same thing, and here's why. So we're seeing that become more and more common, which is why then if you're an organization that doesn't contribute, and you're going to be in more and more of these situations where you don't even qualify to be considered, right? So I think there's an opportunity when we think about the ecosystem for us to advocate if we can get the in, you know, the customers to do what Dree said, right? Hey, make make this a requirement because this benefits. You're going to get a better product because of X, Y, Z. Then that helps us advocate with the vendors to say, look, you're not even going to be on the list if you're not a contributor. So you better be ready for that. And if we can get those pieces going, then we've got a really robust system. The piece I'm passionate about, in addition to that, and and we talked about the fear of kind of this commercial interest and in, in kind of integrating into contribution and, and what does that mean? I think customers should absolutely be contributing back, right? So, you know, part of part of what I would be doing if we could fly and go places over the past year and a half is, you know, part, really what I want to do is say, okay, how do we get this tech leadership community to understand open source from a contribution perspective? And I want that same level of peer pressure among CTOs, CMOs, CDOs to say, hey, if we're going to consume this and have it as part of our technology stack, we also have an impetus to be able to contribute back. And if you've got all those pieces going, then I think we really get where we want to be um, from a community perspective and a contribution perspective. It's, it's yeah. amazing that you're seeing that in RFQs or RFPs. Oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. it's, I'm wondering when you do see that, like how does that come about? Does that come about because you have like a leadership example like the White House that you mentioned, uh, 2008, 2016? Um, that created this kind of impetus towards valuing contribution and valuing um, the open sourceness, or or is it like I, I assume that doesn't happen organically? That some somebody was working on that and somebody was pushing that idea and educating the people who were putting out these bids um, that that actually this is something that should be a criteria for uh, for choice. How did that come about? What like what was the what was the process over the last decade that brought you to where you are today yeah it's a combination of things but evangelizing this kind of behavior is one of them but i think you know these large companies are coin operated you know like they want to get the best result <laughs> for their buck uh, if you will and i think they've actually really learned that if you hire a company that employs you know contributors you know if you hire a company that employs people that have helped build a product <laughs> that you're trying to implement. Uh, you're going to get the best possible architecture. You're going to have a more scalable solution, more secure solution, whatever it is. Like you actually get, you're more likely, I'm not saying it's sort of black and white or anything, but you're more likely to get the best results if you work with the best people, you know? And the best people happen to be those people that built, helped build the product. <laughs> um, oops. I think we lost Dave. You're in uh, charge now, Dries. All right. I'll ask, I'm asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so yeah, I think the economic drivers are the most powerful ones at the end of the day, and helping organizations see that as well. Um, um, you know, makes all the difference. I was reading, my internet froze. Oh no! So, well, no and, I'm sure he's back soon. And if anyone's watching that works for an organization that is a Drupal vendor or helps implement Drupal products, but you're not contributing, call me. That's another part of what we do at the Drupal Association is we want to help you understand how to do contribution. We want to enable that process for you. And we want to help you find the best ways to plug in and help you understand that economic incentive. So if you want to do it, but not sure where to start, please call us. And, and I do have a list of, of big companies I know that do those products. Uh, do that work, but aren't members and contributors today. So you might be getting a call from me proactively because we are, <laughs> <laughs> we are, we are watching. And, and so are, so are those customers. Yeah. And a big part of the Drupal Association's role is to really drive leads, meaning uh, organizations that want to adopt Drupal to the right Drupal companies. And because if you think about it this way, let's say somebody invests $100,000 in a Drupal project, you want the $100,000 to go to those Drupal companies that will contribute back, right? Because there is a return on investment. Like if you give the $100,000 to a Drupal or a company or Drupal company that never gives back, your return is zero as a project. But if you give it to a company, that maybe gives back five percent of every you know everything that they receive, uh, maybe by employing somebody that contributes, right? That is sort of like a five percent dividend, if you will, for the project. And so it's in our best interest to drive as much business to those organizations right. instead okay. of those that don't contribute back at all. And that's a very critical role for Heather and the Drupal Association. Okay, I'm going to be Dave for a moment. I'm going to ask you a question, Dries, that has mm -hmm. that he's posted in the chat. So okay. on make on makers and takers, what advice would you have for companies that are currently carrying most of the load in a project in a project, and are concerned that trying to grow a community will be expensive and will give little return on investment in the first two to three years? Mm. Well, um, it's probably true <laughs> that it will give little return on investment <laughs> in the first two or three years. I think. I talk to a lot of open source projects, but also open source businesses, and they all see the value and the power of having a thriving community like Drupal's, but they also all want to have one overnight. And the reality I think is uh, it takes a while, a long time, probably more than two or three years to really grow a thriving, successful ecosystem around your project. Um, so I guess my number one advice is like be patient, you know, and and while you do that, put the community first. But you always have to put the community first. Uh, that's hard to do as a startup or as a um, maybe an organization that has running out uh, that has a risk of running out of money, you know. Um, so be patient. Make sure you can be patient. If maybe when you're raising money, make make sure you have enough money in the bank to. You know, I think five plus years. Um, but I think um, maybe I can talk a little bit because Dave talked about makers and takers. But one of the key arguments that I made in that blog post, um, you know, uh, it's called balancing makers or takers or something, is that open source software is like a public good, meaning it's a it's an economic term. Right, but it basically means that it's non-excludable. So what I mean by that, or what the con um, uh, economists mean by that, is like if I use Drupal, it doesn't prevent you from using Drupal. It's a little bit like the radio. If I'm listening to the radio, it doesn't limit you from listening to the radio. Uh, and this is in contrast with uh, common goods. So the first one was public goods, but common goods are uh, rivalrous, uh, as they say. So, you know, fishing could be an example of that. We can all fish, but when I catch a fish and I eat it, it means you no longer can catch and eat that fish, <laughs> right? So it's still something we all can do, but, um, 
you know, it's it's different from public good in that I exclude you from using it. And, and software, open source software is a public good, but leads are common goods, right? Like if I get a customer, you won't get that customer, right? And so it's really important to think about how, you know, encourage everybody to use your open source project. Don't care about who uses it. But when it comes to maybe somebody willing to pay <laughs> somebody to help uh, with the project or implement it, you have to be really thoughtful about where you um, where you drive them to. And so think about uh, potential leads being common goods, and then how you do you manage common goods? Because if a com if a customer goes to somebody that doesn't contribute, it's kind of a waste in a way. But versus when it goes to somebody that does contribute, because a little bit of that fish goes back to the project, right? <laughs> right? So it feeds the ecosystem more efficiently, right. more effectively. Right, and that's why you know the DA and Heather have have such an important role, and why they've done such a great job, kind of building out the tooling and the credit system and tracking all of that data, evangelizing, and then driving leads. It's a big kind of thing, and. I really do believe that Drupal leads in this area that we have uh, that we're showing the rest of the open source community uh, how to maybe think about these things. Good point. So, well, on on behalf of of Dave, I'm going to wrap us up. I think we've hit time. Uh, thanks for being here, Dries. Yeah, thank you for being here, Heather. It was thanks. awesome. You were great. <laughs> you too. Thanks for having us, Dave. And. Uh, as you can see in the chat, next week is Carol Payne of Netflix and Larry Fritz from Sony. So that should all be right. another interesting conversation. That's awesome. Thanks all. all. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye.